Let's go to 235. So answer this question about the sophist. Is this now clear that he's a kind of juggler, an imitator of realities? Or are we still uncertain whether he may not truly possess the knowledge of all the things about which he seems to be so able to argue. How could that be, my dear sir? Surely it is pretty clear by this time from what has been said that he is one of those whose business is entertainment. That is to say you must, he must be classed as a juggler <clears throat> and imitator. Of course he <clears throat> must. Look sharp, then. 
It is now our business not to let the beast get away again. Where we, where we have almost got him into a kind of encircling net of the devices we employ in arguments about such subjects so that he will not now escape the next thing. What next thing? Uh, the conclusion that he belongs to the class of conjurers. I agree to that opinion of him too. Um, um, you know, um, did he sneak, sneak in another class? Yes. Right? Before he only he had two or a combination of two. Mm. A juggler and an imitator. Mm. Ah, the conclusion that he belongs to the class of conjurers. Mm -hmm. And Theotetus comes back. I agree to that opinion of him too. It is decided then that we will as quickly as possible <clears throat> divide the image-making art and go down into it. And if the sophist stands his ground against us at first, we will seize him by the orders of reason, our king, to deliver him up to the king and display his capture. But if he tries to make cover in any of the various sections of the imitative art, we must follow him, always dividing the section into which he has retreated until he's caught. For surely neither he nor any other creature will ever boast of having escaped from pursuers who are able to follow up the pursuit in detail and everywhere in this this methodical way. You are right. That is what we must do. To return then to our previous method of division, I think I see this time also two classes of imitation. But I do not yet seem to be able to make out in which of them the form we are speaking is to be found. Uh, do you find that rather curious? Yeah. Right, he's sure there are two classes, but uh, what's his uh, comment? He doesn't know which way to go. But he's... <laughs> this way or that way? Yeah, but he's going to make two uh, division. Good, good. But he doesn't know which way to go with his division. Hmm. He's offering up a nice division. Clearly. But he doesn't know what to do with it. Okay, let's go. Yep. <laughs> Please. First make the division and tell me what two classes you mean. All right, now here goes the great one. Okay, watch what happens. I see the likeness making art as one part of imitation. This is met with as a rule whenever anyone produces the imitation by following the proportions of the original in length, breadth, depth, and giving besides the appropriate colors to each part. Got it? Do you agree with that? Do you see it? Yeah. What's he calling the likeness making art? Right, look here. <laughs> Produce an object by matching that object proportionately.
Right? Right? Very methodical, agree? So, wait a minute. If you want to enlarge anything, that's what he's calling the likeness-making art. Right? Obvious. Right? Good. Yes, but do not all imitators try to do this? Uh-oh. This is an imitation. Pardon? I don't see this as imitation. Well, aren't you imitating a, a smaller by making it larger? Um, what do you call this? What do you call this? I guess so. I don't see that as imitation. What, whatever there is, the created is a likeness to an original. It's a likeness to an original. And so it's not the original. It's following the lines of the original to make something like the original. Right. And you're going to do it proportionately. Mm -hmm. All right. Which is fair. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's see what he does. Uh, yes, but do not all imitators try to do this? Not though to produce some large work of sculpture or painting. For if they reproduce the true proportions of beautiful forms, uh, the upper parts, you know, would seem smaller and the lower parts uh, larger than they ought because we see the former from a distance and the latter close up and close at hand. Uh, what does that do to this? Mm. Is this an, did you just make an example of this? Does it fit? No, he's no. saying that you can't. You can't do it. Can't do it. And if you dare do it. It would be. Uh, well, it would be kind of distorted. The unlike. The unlike. True. Right? Yes. <laughs> what, That's right. <laughs> what does that do to his former position? And negates it, contradicts it, or dumps it. Right. 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 Okay. So the artists abandon the truth and give their figures not the actual proportion but those which seem to be beautiful. Do they not? Certainly. Huh. That then, which is other, but like, we may fairly call a likeness, may we not? Yes. But if it's other, mm -hmm. it's not going to be like, it'll be otherness. Yeah. Uh, I'll ignore that slight difference. And the part of imitation which is concerned with such things is to be called, as we called it before, likeness making. It is, Look it at, is to be so called. Did he take this model and then say we must reject this because if you take it literally you'll find difficulties? In what view, from what viewpoint? From the view of perspective. Mm -hmm. right? If you consider the the role of perspective, then you're going to have to then change things appropriately to match the rules of perspective, not proportion. Or strict proportion. Right. You're going to have to make it look like the way it appears. Hmm. Right? Or the appearance is going to give you the appearance of something which it's not. But it looks like it. All right. It is to be so called. It is to be so called. Yeah. Now then, what shall we call that which appears? Because it is seen from an unfavorable position to be like the beautiful. But which would not even be likely to resemble that which it claims to be like? 
if a person were able to see such large works adequately, shall we not call it, since it appears? But it is not like uh, an appearance? Is it not like an appearance? Certainly. When he's changing his subject now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now everything he's talking about in the art of appearance is to match the appearances, not to match the object. And the art which produces appearance, but not likeness, the most correct name we could give it would be fantastic art. Would it not? By all means. So fantastic is the art that gives the appearance of something. When we're obeying the rules of perspective, we, we take, change all the rules of proportion so that it will appear like the object as it appears to us. Yep. Right. And what did you call that? Fantastic art. Oh. We call it appearance. Appearances. I was uh, uncertain before in which of the two, does he have two? He never came up with two. No. But I was uncertain before in which of the two the sophist should be placed. And even now I cannot see clearly. Hmm. Well, he did all this work, but he doesn't see clearly. The fellow is really wonderful and very difficult to keep in sight. For once more, in the very cleverest manner, he is withdrawn into a baffling classification, which it's hard to track him. So it seems. Wait a minute. Did he set up a, a, did he set up a picture of the sophist and show which one that matches? No. Oh. He just gave two pictures, this one and an object that's going to look like this at a distance, and therefore at a distance the head would be bigger, the feet would be smaller, because in appearance, way away, that would look like this. Calls that the fantastic art. So what? What's it got to do with sophistry? Nothing so far. Nothing so far, but it's a nice argument. Is it not? Yeah, okay, let's make sure he's going to tie it together. So it seems. Do you uh, assent because uh, you recognize the fact? Or did the force of habit hurry you along to a speedy ascent? What do you mean? And why did you say that? Well, we're really, my, my dear friend, engaged in a very difficult investigation. By the way, does this seem difficult? No. For the matter of appearing and seeming but not being, and of saying things, but not true ones. All this is now and always has been very perplexing. You see, Theotet, it is extremely difficult to understand how a man is to say or think that falsehood really exists, and in saying this, not be involved in contradiction. Why? Hey, did he change the subject? Did he apply the examples he just developed? No. So he went through all this work for no purpose. But it introduces, at least on this level of appearance, see? This whole thing was to develop this idea. The idea of appearance. Okay? Notice, appearance is the false image which is, appears real. That is, that matches our perceptions. The false matches the laws of perspective.
in order to create a likeness. That's what he's doing, is he not? He's using that whole exercise just to make that one point. And it's very difficult to talk about this subject. Now, this is where the whole book changes, and now we're going to explore the idea of not being. It's a nice introduction. Maybe it doesn't fit all together, but he's a sophist. Not if you're going in a completely different direction. Well, no, it would have been nice, by the way, for him to take this example and compare it with the sophist. Yeah. There's no comparison. So he escaped us. Wait a minute. Did he escape? The sophist didn't escape. He never made the he never made the contrast. He's saying the sophist escaped us. I didn't even see that it even was an attempt to classify him according to the two images he developed. Not at all. Yeah, well, it'll get better. Okay, now I'm being out. This statement involves the bold assumption that not being exists, for otherwise falsehood could not come into existence. That's the whole position. This, this is where he lives. Right? Takeoff point. We're going to go back to it. But the great Parmenides, my boy, from the time when we were children to the end of his life, always protested against this and constantly repeated both in prose and in verse, never let this thought prevail, saith he that not being is, but keep your mind from this way of investigation. <coughs> so that, right, so that is his testimony, and a reasonable examination of the statement itself would make it most absolutely clear. Let us then consider the matter first, if it's all the same to you. Okay, what are we going to do? See whether or not being exists? No, 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 no. This statement is not clear. So he's going to make it clear. Well, this is not clear. Therefore, he's going to make it clear. So, would you point out the ambiguity in it, sir? It's a statement. But he's oh, I, to I, keep, I, uh, from being, but keep your mind from this way of investigation. This is what he's going to do is to make this. Ah! I want to know whether you think it needs clarification. No. Or what, oh, oh, he thinks it does. I know, and, and that's the very thing that you're supposed to keep away from the investigation. Oh, oh. oh. Well, let's Clarify. see then. He's now going to make this clear. Is that correct? That's what he said. Okay, let's do it. 
Assume my consent to anything you wish. <laughs> Consider only the argument, how it may best be pursued. Follow your own course and take me along with you. Uh, <laughs> what an answer. What do you think of that as an answer? <laughs> He what is that? Be, what is that saying? He just dropped out of the dialogue. <coughs> because of what reason? He assumed my consent to anything. No. Therefore, there's no discussion. That's there's, right. He dropped out. That's right. But see, it's best not to pay too much or close attention to what he says. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what he's not doing. <laughs> okay. Good. Very well. Now tell me, do we venture to use the phrase? Absolute, not being. Of course. If then, not merely for the sake of discussion or as a joke, but seriously. One of his pupils were to ask to consider and answer the question, to what is the designation not being to be applied? How do you think he would reply to this questioner? And how would he apply the term? For what purpose and to what object? Wait a minute, stay with that. Look what he's asking. Okay? That's a difficult question, says Theotetus, does he not? Go pick it up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a difficult question. I may say that for a fellow like me, it is unanswerable. Uh, is it? No. Is it difficult? No. So it's unanswerable. It just wouldn't be applied to be. But this is clear, anyhow, that not being cannot be applied to any being. How did he answer it? Did he say to what it is applied? No. He said to what it is not applied. But he, right, he doesn't. Fact, it can't be applied. It can't be applied. So what does he want? To, to what should the object right, be applied? Oh, it can't be applied. <clears throat> and if not <clears throat> to being, 
then it could not properly be applied to something either. Mm. Why not? Yeah. How could it? So it can't be applied to any object. <clears throat> That's rather curious, see, because uh, uh, <clears throat> well, well, so that last one is if it can't be applied to being then it can't be applied to something. Right. Or, or what is. Uh, doesn't that assume that whatever something is, the reason why it can't be applied to something is because something is, but not being is not. I mean, I don't know. So that reasoning seems good to me. Unless someone else can show well, me why that's absurd. <clears throat> because it cannot be applied to being, it doesn't mean it can't apply to other things. But other things exist. Other than being. <clears throat> but won't, aren't they existent things? I mean, if they exist, then they have some reference to being. This is Ingmar, not seeing the difference between being and existing. This is Ingmar? What happened in the North Country, Ingmar? <laughs> what happened to you? Well, I'm shocked. Are you not shocked, Dave? I'm confused. Oh, well. Wow. So then you're saying that this T stuff, or TIS, something, uh -huh. anything, is different than just being. on a level of apparent things, existing things? Yep, I am. Yeah. I'm so bold, yeah. I think we should be hesitant about that. I, I've never hesitated. Right, like the T, the T is equivalent to the what in a what question, right? Like we call it something when we use it in a particular way. Right? Yes. But if we're asking a what question, we're going to say T. Mm -hmm. And therefore, but this is an answer. Right? Well, I'm that the true T might be something more than just. An apparent thing, an yeah, existing thing. Well, um, on the basis that the question can be translated what? You're well, the word can be used to mean what? It's yeah. not an interrogative. Well, what is it? It's, it's, it doesn't have the accent. It's not interrogative. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, right. So in this case, it means something. Or anything. <laughs> okay. No, I get your reason. I'm following. Therefore. Um, I'd say he needs to explain that <laughs> if he's going to maintain it. Well, no, it's, uh, he's having fun. We can have fun with him. <laughs> um, How could he? See, well, we have his goal, do we not? This is his goal. Do you agree? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. He should first tell us to what what kind of what object non-being can be applied. Then he wants to know, all right, how would someone respond to it? What would their reply be? <clears throat> well, they would then have to answer, how would it be be applied to to a term? What term would, would it there be for it to be applied to? But by the way, it's the same question. What's the purpose of the not being? I mean, this is his goal. One, two, three, right? That's it. How would the term be applied? To what term would it be applied? He's going to tell us, isn't he? How would it be applied? Because first he says, to what is the designation not being to be applied, right? Yeah. If one of the pupils were asked to consider an answer to the question, to what is the designation not being to be, to be applied? And then he says, how would he apply the term for what purpose and to what object? 
we have to know whether or not that is his stated goal. Well, I think the object, what is the designation not being to be applied? That's the last question, to what object? In between, he's asking, how do we think he would have replied it? Well, how would he apply the term? Well, that's, that's a curious question. Like, uh, you would do what with non-being uh, as it applies? How would you apply the term? Yeah, I think he's. That's a curious question. Well, especially since he hasn't defined what he means by not being. Right. And then. But in any case, he wants to know how would you apply the term not being? So he's not looking at the function of non being, he's looking at how you would apply the term to something. And what would your purpose be? And when he says object, Gina, right? the Greek is what do you expect that to do? That's what he means by object. Oh, he doesn't mean the thing. He doesn't mean to what do you apply. He means oh, okay. To do what is to do what? To poil. Poil. That's how you interpret poil. That's right. Well, I'm assuming that's not he's translating. Oh. So, uh, to what object is not the same as to be applied? That's what I see the same. For that, for what purpose? He's asking for function before. Uh, be before he even tells us what non-being is. Well, I mean, he's then you agree this is his goal? This is his goal? And also, of course, it's a question whether or not these are the same. And what does it do before you How would you apply the term? Uh, to what object would you apply the term? How would you? See, it's a how. <clears throat> how would you apply the term? Is that different than being able to talk about what is the object to which you would apply it? It depends upon how much uh, interest he has, the difference between how and a what. So we keep that in mind. We, we, these are his goals. He's not going to go, uh, he's going to cover them. Maybe. Well, see, he's already, I'm, he's already saying that you can't apply it to anything, something or being or anything else. So. Well, isn't, oh, yes, that, isn't that wonderful? Look her. Not being, cannot be applied to being. That's right. Well, that makes sense. What's new? What's new? <laughs> yeah, it's not being. Of course, it's not going to be applied to being. I thought it was pretty strange. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> and you couldn't apply the term to it. But what if you apply it with great devotion and love that it is an object to be forcing? <laughs> I mean, how, how can you be forcing something that you truly love? I mean, I don't see myself forcing myself when I love something, it's it's a total devotion. All right, but keep it together. Total devotion about applying not being to well, being. How does your total devotion overcome that? Because not, not part. I don't see it as non-being. I <coughs> see it as well. He's arguing that there is such a thing as non-being. Yeah, in the text. Non-being as being an object of my in my mind. <laughs> what's due to feel like? <laughs> it could not properly be applied to something either. So there's some existence to something that you can So if you can't apply it to being, uh, does she deal with this possibility? Well, then maybe you could apply it to something else. No, he denies that, right? No, you can't.
So just for the fun of it. Um, So, uh, what do you want to say about the past? You say it is not? If the present is? Is the present, present moment what exists? Uh, what happened to it? Hey, where, what would you say about the past? It's a... Uh... It's what the present became when it no longer existed. I noticed that. Yeah. What would you call about the past? Is it something <laughs> or is it not? It is not. Uh, future. Hey. Also is not. If this can be called being, then this is not being. And this is not being. Yep. Right? Sure. Yes, those are two. So the, the, there's, hey, wait a minute. What did he just say? If it's not applied to being, it can't be applied to anything? Well, you just applied it to something. <laughs> right? Something, yeah. Past, yeah. future. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's go a little further. <laughs> and if not to being, then it could not properly be applied to something either. <laughs> How could it? And this is plain to us that we always use the word something of some being. For to speak of something in the abstract, naked as it were, disconnected from other things is impossible. Yes, it is. What did he just get to do away with? He just rejected a term. What term did he just reject? Then something is. If something is, it has to be. Has right. To be. Right. That's, yeah. So therefore, hey, this is something. This is something. This is something. That so it must have to be. Yeah, that's what he's saying. For him, there we've got it. We always use the word something and of some being. For to speak of something in the abstract, naked, as it were, disconnected from all beings is impossible. What is he denying? The idea of being. What? I thought he was denying the opposite. What? Yeah. He's denying being. The idea of if you talk about something in the abstract, naked, as it were, disconnected from all things, well, that's an abstraction. Right? What, are you, what are you left with? If it's disconnected from all beings, aren't you left with something that isn't being? 
then you're either left with pure being or you're left with well, I'm on the side of pure being so I can't argue the other term <laughs> okay yeah, what's he saying? see what's important in this sentence is that he is not using the word being philosophically If he is using this word being, that designates the nature of reality which is unchanging. And has other marks besides that, but that's the word being. How is he using that word here? See, the word being is abstract. It's naked, as it were. It's disconnected from all other things. He sticks in the word being. And that's in the Greek. It's in the Greek. Yeah. So he's using good old ontos in a curious way, isn't he? Yes. That is, he's ignoring its philosophical meaning. Yeah. Well, he, his, his opening sentence that we use the word something of being, that is, we always use the word something of being, is not ever true. It's never true. Yeah, so it's kind of problematic start. So. To begin with, he's mixing up yeah. two realms. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah. Because no matter what thing you're looking at, no matter what you do about it, it's not going to be being. Right. It's not going to be being. It's not going to be being. No matter what thing you're looking at, it's not going to be being. I was just going to say. No matter how much you abstract from it or separate it from anything else, it's still not going to end up being being. That's right. So in this paragraph, would you agree he's mixing terms? Easy to agree. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a minor point. It's a big point. Right? So Plato, nowhere in Plato have we seen him referring to being as something. Oh, that's something. It's being. When he uses T, it, it doesn't mean being the wrong being. It's just being the same. No, being is used in opposition to appearances. And the world that's visible is the world of appearances. Becoming, <coughs> not being. Watch what he does now. Yes, he is. You assent because you recognize that he who says something must say some one thing. Yes. That's well, not true. And it's not true. Because mm. you may say something in the plural. That's true. Right? That's true. Yeah. But it looks good. It looks good. It sounds good. And you will agree that something or some in the singular is the sign of one. In the dual, two. And in plural, many. Of course. What does that do to what he just said about one thing? Well. It now can be dual or many. But when he said that, Pierre, he said that he who says something, and the word that's translated for something is in the singular. He who says something no. must say some one thing. That fits the Ex fact that he's got a singular yeah. something. Yeah, and then does he go on to say uh, it's also dual? You agree that something or some in the singular is a sign of one. In the dual of two. And plural? Well, he's got the dual and plural forms of T in that sentence. Uh, what are you doing that for? Well, because I don't think it agrees with what you're saying. <laughs> no, no. Does it make sense to what he is saying? Uh, 
Well, what I said is in the Greek, and it's just a comment on the Greek. Um, <clears throat> He's after saying, he wants to say that you have to recognize that if you're saying something, you must say one thing. Does he stay to that? In the paragraph that was just read? Or does some now can be dual or many? It can be all three. Hmm. Does he change his mind? I don't know. Well, no, no. Well, then is it true that if you say something, you're only talking about one thing? Well, I say that the sentence we're looking at now can be broken up into three parts. And the first part agrees with what you just said. But, but the second and third are additions. What if that do go to the sentence before that when he, he, he assents that because you recognize that he who says something must say some one thing? What does what it do? That, yeah. It adds on to it. I mean, well, yeah, but, but how but can it, it add adds it to it? It adds points? on to it. Is it consistent with what he originally says? Right. So far, it seems to me consistent. To add on to something without explaining why you're adding on? Well, except for not having an explanation for why he's doing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> why are you making faces? Because uh, I, don't, I, don't, I guess I just don't see a problem here yet. Oh. I'd like to, but. Yeah, by the way, um, I'm only going to say one thing. Of course, I may end up saying many, but that doesn't change it. It's still one thing. Oh, it is. Oh, I might also say ju just one thing, but I want to end up talking about two things. That's the same thing as one thing. Well, <laughs> if I wanted to understand the three phases that the idea of something can go through, I think he's doing all right. You can have a singular phase of something. You can have something or some one or ones considered in a dual aspect. Mm -hmm. And there's a plural form of something, some things in a group. Yeah. In order, then in order for him to mean what he says, then he would have to say that any time you're talking about one thing, it can cover many things so long as you're considering it as a unity and call that unity one. That would have been better? Oh, if it would be better, then this is weaker. I suppose. No, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's a poor imitation. I'm, I'm gonna. I want to shut up now. No, 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 no way. Think about it more. No, no. Come on, we just keep going. We're having fun. <laughs> okay. I want help from Barbara. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Of course. Okay. And he who says, hey, and he who says not something must quite necessarily say absolutely nothing. <laughs> quite necessarily. Hey, if he doesn't say anything, he's silent. That's all, he's silent. then we cannot even <laughs> concede that such a person speaks but says nothing. Of course not. Can't say he speaks if he says nothing. We must even declare that he who undertakes to say not being does not speak at all. The argument could go no further in perplexity. Uh, see, let's stay with that. How about that one? We must declare that he who undertakes to say not being does not speak at all. It's sophistry. Huh? I <laughs> said that's sophistry. Why? Good. Why? <clears throat> well, because it's like a sophistical attack. Obviously, if I say not being, then, I'm, then I am speaking. And I don't know, I just get that kind of gotcha, that gotcha feel. Oh, I could, I could show you why you are actually not speaking at all when I am speaking, because you're saying that you're saying not being, well, you're not saying anything, therefore you're not speaking. 
But that's ridiculous. So you have to change the word speak, don't you? Yeah. Uh, change because, your ideas. Because if you mean literally speak, he's, he's simply wrong. Because you can speak not being. Yeah. Uh, does he want to assume that what he means, again, we have to change it? That he who undertakes to say not being uh, must discuss in what way non being is or is not and explore the very nature of what is called not being. That's not what he's doing. Still no definition of not being. Right. Notice our, our Theotetus comes back with the immortal words. Quite necessarily. How can you conceive that such a person speaks but says nothing? Then we cannot, I don't understand that. Then we cannot even conceive that such a person speaks but says nothing. See, says nothing. If you use the word means nothing, then it may, it may make sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So in other words, you have to change what he's saying in order for it to make sense. But then you're interpreting the text broadly. He's taking things very literally. That's, very what, he's, that's what he's doing. It's literal. Yeah. So you can't say it says nothing. It's impossible. That's because literally, if he says something, he says something, whether it's not being or apples and, and carrots. And if he speaks, he's yeah. saying something. Right? Yeah. 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 That's why up above when he says, and, you, and he who says not something must quite necessarily say absolutely nothing. Well, look here. I'm oh, sorry. You're coming to a conclusion too soon. Okay. This is why. For there still remains, my friend, the first and greatest of perplexities. It affects the very beginning of the matter. I'm glad we're going to get to the beginning, finally. <laughs> what do you mean? Do not hesitate to speak. <laughs> to that which is may be added or attributed some other things which is. Yeah, and you really should read right. to that being. Maybe right. To that which is may be added or attributed to some other thing which is. Right. And those are both onto, ontos, right? To, to that onti, to that being, right? That should be being. Or attributed to some other being. Put the word being in there. It belongs there. Hmm. So to that which is may be added or subtracted to some other being, which is. They're both beings, yeah. Yeah, 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 they're both beings. To that being may be added or attributed to some other being. Yeah. I, Theotina should be saying, wait a minute. We just said that we couldn't uh, attribute anything to being. Not well, we just changed. Applying things to being. Yeah, but he, well, he just changed his mind. That's okay. <laughs> He's a changing man. Shall we assert that? Right? Shall we assert that to that which is not anything which can be attributed? Isn't that a great sentence? And watch why Theotetus understood it quickly and said, certainly, certainly not. But shall we assert that to which? Wait a minute, we're going to get. Yes, he has Thomas Taylor. Yes, please. But shall we say that anything belonging to beings can ever be present to that which is not? Mm. Better. Much yeah. clearer. Much clearer. Yeah. Shall I ever 
or come to be in, come to be towards. Okay, watch now. Now we assume that all number is among the things that are being. Mm -hmm. among the now we assume that all number is among the things which we can say are being. But that's obvious, isn't it? How did we get to number? <laughs> We just jumped oh, oh, in and put in numbers. That's a being that's being applied to being. Mm -hmm. When you walk these and you go into it. Go ahead. What does he say about number? That it, ha that it is being. It is being. being. Right. All number. No, all number. Is among beings. No, I agree. There's enough room for being to have all numbers in it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the case? Well, the most important ones. How is it not the case? Can you tell me why? <laughs> Nothing. Here is where he needs an explanation. Hmm. Show us in what way you mean that all numbers are among being. A little paragraph or two, which is why he goes on at such length. Yes, if anything can be assumed, it's just being. Look here, what does that mean? So, yeah. You can assume anything you want to be being. Yeah. There's no problem with being here. You can show me anything you want. It reminds me of a class in which this philosopher said that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And we can. That's knowledge. He asserted that that was knowledge. Well, only people who don't appreciate the idea of what a number is would agree with that. Right. So I was thinking. Right. That Theotetus' response is like that. Hey, if anything can be assumed to be, 2 plus 2 equals 4. <laughs> By the way, do you think that's true? No, no, no. I just think that that's the attitude my teacher had. No, here's where he needs an explanation. In what way would you say that all numbers can be classed along with being? That's all. <laughs> He just ignores it. Modest, ign modest. Then let us not even undertake to attribute either the singular or the plural to number to not being. We should apparently not be right in undertaking that as our argument shows. How then could a man either utter in speech or even so much as conceive in his mind things which are not or not being apart from number? Tell me how number is involved in such a question. Is that an interesting question? Come on, take a look at it. Come on, what, is, what did he just admit? How then could a man either utter in speech or even so much as conceive in his mind things which are not or not being apart from number? Now, is he making a connection between not being a number? It looks like it. Did he just a moment ago say it's connected with being? He did. Did he just change his mind? It looks like it. Being is not being. Yeah, being is not being. Right, right, right. That's a minor point. Numbers being but not being. Right. Theotetus. 
Here, Theotetus wakes up. Mm. Tell me how number is involved in such conceptions. <laughs> That's what I want. You too? Yeah. Now we're going to get a beautiful answer. When we say things which are not, do we not attribute plurality to them? Uh, to that answer? No. No? Well, let's hope he's getting there, shall we? Yes. Certainly. And in saying a thing which is not, do we not equally attribute the singular number? Obviously. A to A, we attribute a single number. Obviously. And yet we assert that it is neither right nor fair to undertake to attribute being to not being? Very true. Do you see then it's not that it's impossible rightly to utter or to say or to think of not being without any attribute, but it is a thing inconceivable, inexpressible, unspeakable, irrational. Absolutely. Now, what did he just agree to? You can't think of not being without an attribute. It has to have an attribute. It has to have an attribute. Which is something like the one itself having an attribute. Mm. I mean, uh, but not being has an attribute. It's pink. Is that a worthwhile notion they, they, to raise? Should he not have a few words about it? He should. Yeah. No, well, that's a minor point. But he does make a distinction between saying something about it, but it is a thing inconceivable, which inexpressible, unspeakable, and irrational. So he's contradicting himself right after that. But that's oh, that's only minor. Okay. Right. I mean, this Absolutely. is a, yeah. This is a very thorough philosophical work. Then, uh, um, then uh, was I mistaken just now in saying that the difficulty I was going to speak of was the greatest uh, in our subject? But is there hey. still greater? Was I mistaken in saying that uh, the di that the difficulty I was going to speak of was the greatest in our subject? Is there still a greater one we can mention? Why, my dear fellow, don't you see, by the very arguments we've used, which are all wonderful and sound, that not being reduces him who would refute it to such difficulties that when he attempts to refute it, he is forced to contradict himself. Got that? Now we have a new takeoff. Got it? Now you have to keep that one in mind. Picture it. You know, take a minute. Picture it. See? Well, that when he attempts to refute all the arguments that we have just given, he's forced to contradict himself. By the way, did we find weaknesses in his argument? Contradictions. Contradictions? Yeah. Well, you know what? That's he, a, because he's talking about not being. He's going he's gonna to show you that you're going to contradict yourself if you dare refute his arguments. Hmm. Yeah. That's noble. Let's see how he does it. What do you mean? Speak still more clearly. You must not look for more clearness in me. Mm. <laughs> 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 For although I, may, I maintain that not being could have nothing to do with either the singular or the plural number, I spoke of it just now, and I'm still speaking of it as one. For I say that which is not. You understand it purely, simply? Yeah? Yes. Yes. After all, I've been all the time saying you can't talk about it. I've been talking about it this whole while, the whole time. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I must be contradicting myself. Mm -hmm. 
And again, a little while ago, I said it was inexpressible, unspeakable, irrational. Uh, uh, do you follow me? Yes, of course. Then when I undertook to attach the verb to be to not being, I was contradicting what I said before? Evidently. Well then, when I attached this verb to it, did I not address it in the singular? Yes. Ah, good. And when I called it irrational, inexpressible, and unspeakable, I addressed my speech to it as singular. Of course you did. But we say that if one is to speak correctly, one must not define it as either uh, singular or plural, but we must not even call it it at all. For even by this manner of referring to it, one would be giving it a form of the singular. What did you just wipe out? This whole idea of number. So it's a very interesting work that follows logically, does it not? What's going on? It seems like he's trying to uh, replace being in a philosophical sense with appearance. I would certainly hope hope he achieves his goal. Does he seem to have a couple of problems in doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how does he understand his own reasoning? Next paragraph. This is the closing one, all right? Oh, it's two paragraphs. But poor me, what can anyone say to me any longer? For you would find me now, as always before, defeated in the refutation of not being. So as I said before, we must not look to me for correctness of speech about non-being. But come on, let's uh, go look for it, you and me. Come on, let's do it anyhow. What do you mean? Yeah, and does that, is that necessary? Here comes his explanation. Come, I beg you, make a sturdy effort, young man as you are, and try with might and main to say something correctly about not being without attributing it to it, either existence or unity or plurality. Go ahead. You do it. You do it. I failed. <laughs> right? Is that what he's saying? I love it. And Theodidus comes back. That I should be possessed of great and absurd e eagerness for the attempt if I were to undertake it with your experience before my eyes. Well, if you like, let's say no more of you and me. <laughs> but until we find someone who can accomplish this, let us confess that the sophist has in most uh, rascally fashion hidden himself in the place we cannot explore. <laughs> Has he tried to identify the sophist at one point, any point? Has he put him in any of the categories? No. But um, he failed. He never began. <laughs> He's a puff. He pooped, he puffed away. Smoke. That's what I see it And mirrors. What? I said, and mirrors. Yeah, okay. From this point on, he's going to introduce the idea of art. Okay? So we quit. Right? See where we are? We're going to enter into the idea of art. And I will accept donations from those who might come to enjoy the purely philosophical. Thank you. Oh, thank you.
Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay, we're 239, 240, right? That's where we're coming back to. How do you find it? How do you find it? Huh? Oh, sorry. No. Yeah, no, no, it's I, important. I don't enjoy it at all. Uh, That's right. Uh, What's he doing? I, I feel like I'm getting work, taking advantage of it. I enjoy it when I see it. But I get a headache when I, I know I'm getting conned. And I want to see through it. Okay. Well, yeah. but. Thank you. My place is open tomorrow. Please join us. Here, would you like to join us also? Great. We're in. Everybody. If we're talking about the negative use of the term sophist, and then the discussion is not being, and then he says the sophist has in most rascally fashion hidden himself in a place we cannot explore. The, it, it's, right, the pathologos doesn't exist. Right? So far, nothing exists. <laughs> no, no, I understand, but I guess what I'm saying is um, there's truth in here. There's truth in this. You'll find it, I hope. That, that the sophist has in most rascally fashion hidden himself in a place. Well, that's not true. Uh, it's not true. We cannot explore. We can explore. No, not only that. No, no. But he, he never tried. Yeah. Like, has he given any example of what sophistry is? Tongue is cheap, yes. what, what's that? No. Has he, no. He's not. Of what a sophist is? No. Is that what said? Not, not to find him, describe him, right? Give examples of what he's doing. Right? Under what circumstance does he work best? Right? We want to know whether or not he follows an art or not. And what is his purpose? See, we still don't have purpose because we haven't discussed him yet. Purpose, art. Oh. Thank you, Peter. Very strange work. 